So I, I think for us and the work that we do and, and, and what we're helping our clients do with their brands, with the way they engage the world and with the way their brands happen is our, our mental model should be movies. How mm. can we tell stories in really immersive ways that are really creative um, that will come to life on the devices and in the places people are. So that's one of the things I'm obsessed with right now is um, thinking about brand and identity and design as storytelling. Welcome to Obsessed Show, a podcast that is designed to inspire, featuring some of the most creative people in the world. I'm your host, Josh Miles. Let's talk about today's episode. Today on Obsessed Show, I'm chatting with the co-CEO, Chief Creative Officer of global brand experience firm Siegel & Gale, Howard Belk. Howard has a unique design point of view. Over the past 25 years, he's served scores of Fortune 500 companies, including Bristol Myers Squibb, CVS Caremark, Hewlett Packard, and SAP by leveraging the concept of simplicity to activate customers and employees. He challenges design teams across the world to bring humanity to brands. You could say Howard was born to design, and maybe we'll dig into that story here in a moment. After founding a New York City-based design company at the age of 28, which was purchased by Omnicom in 2001, Howard joined Siegel & Gale in 2004. Since then, he's brought simplicity, a global perspective, and systems thinking to designing brand programs for some of the largest companies on the planet. You may know, but I'm a total branding geek at heart, so I'm incredibly excited to chat with Howard about the future of branding and to learn more about Siegel and Gale. So without further ado, please enjoy this conversation with Howard Belk. Okay, kids, all the way from New York City, I've got Howard Belk. Howard, welcome to Obsessed Show. Hey, thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be here. And um, yeah, you sent me some really interesting set of questions, so I'm looking forward to digging in. Well, hey, I got to admit it, when I got the email from somebody representing Siegel and Gale, I was pretty geeked out. Um, you guys have done amazing work, uh, have a very storied past, which is awesome. But I started digging into some of your writing and some of your work on robots and AI. And I have a feeling we have a little bit of a uh, fellow interest in in future and futurism and those kind of things, too. So I'm really excited to dig into all of this today. But, you know, before we do we've been stacking up a bunch of these recordings lately. And so I would just like to timestamp these. So if something else crazy happens in 2020, we don't seem <laughs> insensitive for not mentioning how the robot overlords took over in November or whatever. <laughs> so it's it August. Too. <laughs> it could totally happen. I'm surprised it hasn't yet. Um, in August, 2020, here we sit, um, you're in New York. How have things been different for you? How are you doing? And, you know, are, are you guys all still remote? Um, fill us in. Um, I, you know, I, I'm doing fine. Um, and I realize how fortunate I am to, um, to be doing fine because I'm, you know, very aware, as I know you are, of how many people are struggling right now. It's a, it's a year like no other. And, um, you know, so my heart goes out to people that are struggling, you know, because it's, it's, it's hard out there, but, um, I'm, I'm lucky and blessed. I'm, I'm with my family. I'm safe. Um, they're safe. My friends are safe. I'm connected with a lot of people, you know, that are close to me. My, my mother, thank goodness, who's in her eighties. She's safe. Mm. So, um, you know, that's all good. And, and I'm, I'm really grateful for that. Um, the Siegel and Gale, the business, you know, as you said, we, we, we are a, a story company. We're actually in our 51st or 52nd year right now. So we, mm. we, this company has been through a lot. I'm, I'm in my 17th year with the firm. Um, never a year quite like this, but we've been through ups and downs. You know, the, the, the dot-com crash, the financial meltdown, and, and now the, the pandemic. So um, we are lucky that we have a brand. Um, and and we do have um, a great you know teams of people that even in a you know in a world like this that's sort of been turned upside down and people have had to entirely change how they work. I've been blown away by you know the Seal and Galers around the world and how they've just you know stepped up and, and figured it out and have barely missed a step really. Um, so it's totally different, Josh. But um, 
we're, we're, we're figuring it out every day, you know, um, it's 2020. Well, our, 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 our mantra has been, let's, um, let's distinguish between what we can control and what we can't control and focus our efforts on the latter and be um, pretty chill about the former. Yeah. It's a good point of view. Um, for some people who are listening, they might be like, I know I've heard of that firm before, but tell us a little bit about like locations and how you guys are shaped and staffed, like um, just help people get their arms around the company and how it's structured. Sure. So Siegel and Gale was founded in 1969 by one of the giants of at the time, the identity business, but that over the decades has really morphed into the branding business. Um, Alan Siegel, um, you know, was a real visionary and he still is. Uh, I, I, actually, Alan turned 82 on Wednesday of this week. Mm, that's Jack. awesome. Um, he's our chairman emeritus today. I was lucky enough to work with him for nine years when I first joined the firm. But um, Alan started the company around this notion of simplicity. And at that time, you know, through the 70s and, and uh, early 80s, language simplification became something that a lot of people and companies and governments focused on. And Alan early on recognized that, you know, simplicity is kind of at the center of great relationships between companies and, and, and people. And that, that actually is the, the foundation of experience itself, which is where it brings mm-hmm. up today. So. The firm started in New York City, very quickly became one of the really preeminent um, identity companies along with Landor, Lippincott, Unspock Roseman in Portugal back in the day, Wolf Owens, um, and um, really has survived and thrived you know, over the, de- over the decades since. Omnicom bought Siegel and Gale um, in the very early aughts. Um, and, and, it be, and so the company became part of that network, which has been um, really important for the continued success and growth of, of the company. And today we have offices in New York, Los Angeles, San Francisco, London, Dubai, and Shanghai, and a really close affiliate relationship with a, um, a terrific firm in Tokyo. And about how many people are across all those offices? Around 250 people. So we're we're, we're um, a lean organization in a way, you know, considering our, our scale and size, mm-hmm. um, and, and that how we work has really evolved over the years. So interestingly, um, we do we we do more work, you know, more programs with smaller teams now than we've ever done. Yeah, that's cool. Well, I want to go back to your your origin story because I understand you were basically born with a Pantone book in your hand. Uh, wow. <laughs> so, tell us about how you found yourself here at Siegel and Gale from a young age. Well, I'm not sure Pantone was around in the year I was born. Um, <laughs> okay, but, I may have know, made that part up. It was a, it was a good one. Um, well, you know, my parents were really into art. My father really was into. Um, art and encouraged me at a, a young age to kind of dive into it, which I did. I, you know, I, um, when I was, you know, around 13 or something, I remember he, he took me out to lunch with a creative director that he knew in Philadelphia and who talked about, you know, design as a thing. I didn't even really know it existed. Mm-hmm. Um, and how, you know, that, that was sort of central to his career and things like that. I still remember that guy's name. And, um, so it, it sort of set me on that path. So I really focused on art and, 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 and things like that. Um, you know, I did well enough in, in high school to graduate early. I skipped my senior year, got admitted to um, what was then Philadelphia College of Art, now is University of the Arts in Philadelphia, and got into a really strong design program. And, um, you know, my career was set off. And one of the funny things, though, it, um, well, I was in design school. My father had been in the newspaper business and then the public relations business, with, but always was an artist, you know, in his own right. And, that, you know, was really into printmaking. And so, um, you know, in his, he turned like 50 or in his early 50s, he just, he get, you know, he stopped working and said, I'm going to art school. I want to, I want to dive into the printmaking. So it, for a couple of years, he and I were at University of the Arts together. I was in the graphic design <laughs> department and he was in the printmaking department. And that was really trippy. 
you know, kind of passing running each other on the quad. <laughs> but it was fun, you know, and, and my classmates thought it was awesome. Yeah, I remember so, you know, um, being in college and, you know, you get a couple of people who are, you know, older in their life and they're back to school and learning something new and be like, oh, that's so cool that you're 20, 30 years older than me and, and here alongside. But in that case, it was your dad. <laughs> yeah, and that, I think it happens. It happens in the arts a lot. You know, yeah. People had a passion and they put it aside for one reason or another and then just realize it's it's um, I can't I can't not do this. So how did you get to branding? Like what, was that something that you got excited about early on or is that something that kind of later in your career became interesting? It it was, you know, when I, when I first, you know, started in the business, people weren't talking about brands and branding like they do today. You know, Um, it was really about identity design. And Mm -hmm. so I was always interested in that and on the periphery, but I founded a company that was more of a communications design firm and engaged in, in I call it, you know, sort of projects, not programs. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, early in my career, I, you know, I really loved that. It was about materials and, and making very precious things that were impactful and special and things like that. But they were, in a way, sort of one-off pieces. And so it was really sort of, in the middle of my career that I started really seeing what was happening, you know, at at identity firms um, and the scope and scale of their programs and projects and the impact, the lasting impact, what they had done um, was having, you know, on the world versus, you know, making a very lovely, you know, brochure or communications piece or something like that, which, you know, really um, had a had a lifespan, you know, I don't know how mm-hmm. long it is. I mean, possibly in months, you know, certainly, you know, less than two years and, and versus a branding program, which would set a company on a course that would last for a decade or more, you know? So that's what sort of attracted me to it is that notion of employing design and design thinking to impact a lot more people, you know, on a, on a much larger stage under much brighter lights. So did that evolution from um, projects to programs, as you said, did that happen under your own agency or is that something that you really kind of took on when you came to Siegel and Gale? Well, first of my company, we, we, we leaned into it and we built a practice mm-hmm. area and we won some really interesting projects, um, programs, but we were, um, you know, now in hindsight, pretty unsophisticated in, in our thinking uh, mm-hmm. compared to a company like Seal and Gale and some of our principal competitors who are are sort of bringing a science to it in a way and, and are you know, employing research tools and insights and a set of facts to create briefs that then designers can work from. And, and um, so uh, it was really a kind of a... Um, my, my company was bought because we became very digitally oriented. We were named by Graphics Magazine, one of the top 10 digital companies in the world in the late 90s. Omnicom was really attracted to that and bought the company. But then, you know, that was sort of in the time of the dot-com explosion, you know, 2000 mm-hmm. to 2002 ish. And the whole world got reordered then, you know, as it very likely could be right now. Um, and so within the Omnicom network, our company got fold it into another big digital company. So um, from there, I went first to um, Interbrand and got some insight into this more expansive view of, uh, of branding and identity. And then the chief creative officer job opened up at Siegel and Gale, which Omnicom had purchased by then. And I had met Alan Siegel before and um, I went into interview there um it was really a fun experience i went in you know like 11 a.m one morning and um had a great meeting with alan and, and the, the uh, head of the new york office uh, and, and i said listen i'm really interested in this but you know I, I, I don't want to waste a lot of time on something that won't happen so um you know i'm interested but let's sort of make a decision quickly. So they called me at like two o'clock that afternoon and said, the job here is if you want. <laughs> How's that for quick? <laughs> that was great. 
And so I took it and that was, that was, um, I loved it because I had, you know, in running the business and going through the dot com, you know, melee, a lot of my time had been diverted into things other than design. And so, so to go back, and I was the CEO of that company, to go back as the chief creative officer of Siegel and Gale, um, God, it simplified my world. You know, I just had to, the, uh, suddenly the things I was devoting energy to got much um, tighter in scope. Mm-hmm. And, um, I really, I really loved it. And, and it was a great time for Siegel and Gale too, in a way. The company had been dinged up also in the dot-com crash. There's so many marketing and you know, yeah. design companies were, but there was a lot of there there. And so we went back in, we leaned into, you know, what was the singular idea behind Siegel and Gale, which Alan had landed on, which is, you know, simple as smart, being the simplicity company. And we just said, you know what, we're going to really lean into that maybe in a big way. It's more relevant than it ever was. And so we rebuilt that the Siegel and Gale. And that kind of remains your differentiator today, right? Absolutely. That's kind of the main thing that you guys lean into. Totally. Yeah. And, and it's, it's, it's wonderful to have that kind of clarity um, about what's important and where do you begin any kind of design exercise or creative exercise or strategic exercises. What is the essence of the issue right here? And how can we strip away anything that's extraneous and really devote all of our creative power to exploring and exploiting that idea? Yeah, that's great. I, you know, one of the interviews that I found um, with you, you were talking about how Siegel and Gale actually originated the phrase brand voice. Uh, and maybe you even said trademarked. <laughs> um which makes me a little embarrassed because in my agency that I ran for 16 years, we talked about brand voice all the time. So we were using your trademark and we weren't supposed to be, but um, talk us through the importance of that. You can send the check to New York. You can send the check to New York. <laughs> That's right. I'll send that, you all the royalties from the show. <laughs> that, that was a brilliant idea. It happened before I got to Siegel and Gale. Um, probably, you know, in the nineties, early nineties, maybe even where <clears throat> Alan and, and some folks there, you know, realize that um, this the notion of voice broadly is is an idea that can lead you to what is sort of unmistakably um, a brand. You know, what mm-hmm. is the the, the, the the sound, the voice, the experience, the topics, the conversations that that brand talks about in ways that no other brand does. And if you can zero in on that and really sort of um, flesh it out and then codify it into some some filters for how the the brand you know speaks behaves and thinks in the world um you know that that's that's the essence of identity well another phrase that i think gets thrown around a lot these days is this idea of brand experience how do you guys define that or how do you you know put some meat on that concept yeah, you know, I, I think of it as like, how does this brand happen? You know what I mean? Like, how does it do what it does? You know, in, in, um, and what's consistent about that? And, and, and how does it land on people? I mean, is it recognizable? Is it distinctive? Is it, you know, an enjoyable experience no matter what it is? Is it crystal clear? Um, and then are we employing... Um, the technologies and platforms that people are engaging with in delivering the brand, you know, in, in engaging with conversations with the world and making our products and, and, and terms of use clear and accessible. So um, experience is all of that. Um, it's how the brand happens. Well, you guys, as you mentioned, have been through some up and down markets in the past. So this is not the first dip that you guys have seen. Um, I would imagine if anybody has a good point of view of this, it's probably you guys would, how do you think brands are going to respond in the next 12 to 24 months? You know, what is the, the short term future of branding looking like, or are there trends that you guys are already spotting, um, and things that are already in motion? Um, you know, in, in a way, I think the, the world just got smaller and, so I think that, you know, the next 
you know, 12 to 24 months, you know, brands and companies are going to, are, are going to focus, you know, intently on that, on a more immediate world that they serve and that they have relationships with and that they can rebuild from. Um, so I, I, I think that's kind of what it's going to be all about. Do you um, think that's contracting or more just a focus? Um, well, I think, you know, many, many businesses have contracted right now, you know, um, and depending on your industry. There's some, you know, that, you know, this is a bonanza for you know, Amazon, for example, or mm-hmm. everyone ordering in and things like that. But those are the exceptions. So I think um, for most companies, they're going to begin two, uh, 2021 smaller than they began 2020. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, early in the, in this phase, people might've said, well, this will last a couple months and then things will sort of snap back to the shape and size they were before. Now I think it's become clear that, um, for most companies, it won't snap back to the size and shape exactly that it was before. And they're coming to terms with that. And they said, okay, that's our new reality, but we still have to grow. We still have to um, serve our, our customers. We have to engage and attract new employees. So they'll, they'll start rebuilding from that new place and brand will be a big part of that. The world just got smaller for most companies and people. And so companies are going to focus on that smaller world with greater intensity because the stakes are high. You know, companies have to grow. And so they're going to be focused on how do we maintain what we have, enhance the relationships that we have, reconnect, rebuild, um, and, and how we behave and, you know, in this world is going to be key to that because of all the change happening and the sort of behavioral standards that are being applied to companies and things like that. Well, I'd seen you guys writing about um, some interesting trends in m and happening sort of maybe coincidentally and, and maybe as a response to this, um, do you see more of that kind of reverse thing happening? And can you kind of talk through your thoughts on that perspective? One thing that's happened as a result of the economic disruption is, um, you know, a lot of companies um, are in survival mode and they're going to look, how do we do that? And so, for many of them, it could be combining with former competitors and saying, listen, we're stronger together. Both of us um, are, could struggle if we remained by ourselves. So you're going to see, a, I think, a lot of those kind of combinations that are sort of forced by um, need. And then you're also going to see some companies that are in really strong financial you know, shape looking out at um, companies they want to acquire. Because mm-hmm. they have great products, they have great customers, they have great technologies, and suddenly they're in, um, you know, sadly a vulnerable state. <laughs> You're going to have uh, probably a little bit of predatory behavior. Um, so some of it will be predatory, some of it will be survival, some of it will be friendly, some of it maybe not so friendly. But I mean, at the end of the day, I think that um, probably beginning in, in 2021, we'll see a fair amount of business combinations. Mm-hmm. And you know that those are the those are the things that drive business for branding firms because those mm-hmm. companies come together, a lot of complexity results. You've got to solve brand architecture issues, you've got to solve, solve design issues, naming issues, overlapping product issues, and and um, that's where you know companies like CEO come in to help sort all that out in a way that um, is is manageable and and from which you can build in years to come. So maybe we can go down this this rabbit hole as part of this looking into the future thing. But um, I'm I'm especially curious what you see as the role of technology and how brands will compete in the future when we have things like like AI and robots and, you know, all kinds of of interesting things happening with the Internet, of course, on any given day. Mm-hmm. Um, what do you see as the major factors kind of in that space? Uh, well, you know, technology is is the biggest sort of change that's happening probably in so many parts of the world and branding is no exception. And so, you know, in the sort of immediate, it's how are people accessing, learning about, engaging with, purchasing, 
today. And they're doing it from the palm of their hand, from mobile devices. And so as we think about identity and systems and look and feel and experience, we're, we're beginning with how do how are people going to really engage with this company and, and turning processes and workflows upside down in a way and have that be thinking about you know dynamic imagery and voices and messaging and things like that as the starting place for design system. So that's happening for sure. And that's really exciting. That's not bad. That's good. You know, <laughs> apart from that, you've got AI and, um, and robotics. And when I say robotics, I don't necessarily mean R2D2, you know, and C3PO, but it's like anything that's sort of automated and and, and uh, humanistic, you know, so it could be voids mm-hmm. and, and all, all kinds of things like that. That's going to be um, in widespread use. And so one of the really interesting things about that is for, for brands is how do we bring um, humanity to things that are automated and they're not being run by people? You know, how, how can mm-hmm. we make sure that they are intuitive that they're really responsive, that they, you know, are, are using the latest technology so that um, that sort of scaled up automated response is actually working for people. And then beyond that, you know, can those systems and tools and platforms actually have some humanity? Can they actually mm-hmm. help people do what the things that make them human? you know, engage in, in a way that feels caring, that feels thoughtful, that feels bespoke, have them make connections, have them enable people to do important things, um, take frustrations out of your life, you know, um, those can all be brand moments and they can all be unique to, you know, one brand versus another. So that's um, for designers to think about that um, is very interesting and important. I've had a chance to talk to a lot of um, CEOs and firm leaders, uh, and it's interesting, especially the ones who come up with a creative path to understand, like, even how they spend their day, like how. And so I'm curious, coming through the design path yourself, um, what what is a typical work week if there even is one for you? How how frequently are you kind of like in in the work and advising on creative and how much is it purely um, client uh, facing and strategy and writing and those kind of things. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's, I talked earlier in this conversation about how, what a joy it was to join Siegel and Gale as chief creative officer. Um, and it was, you know, so sadly today, you know, I don't get to do, I don't get to spend as much of my time, you know, talking to designers and things like that as I would like to. And I don't think I ever will, but that is the most fun that I have is, you mm-hmm. know, we're, thinking about briefs, thinking about clients, and just thinking about, you know, what could be the driving idea for a brand and identity and, and, you know, set of experiences and how to, how to make it happen, you know, how how to, how to implement it in different, in different platforms. That's the most fun I have mainly because um, the people I'm working with when I'm doing that, you know, they, they are so, creative and so, you know, surprisingly fresh, you know. So um, some of my time is spent doing that, but not as much as I would like. You know, we're a global company, so, you know, a fair amount of my time is just, you know, making sure the machine is running, you know. And mm-hmm. what does that come down to? Mostly it comes down to people. Do we have the right people? Do they have the right tools? Um, are there things that we can do to... Um, you know, help with collaboration, um, you know, stuff is always going off the tracks. Can we help people, you know, rise up and deal with that moment in a way that, you know, allows us just to move on, you know, and, and solve it um, and, and not let it disrupt more than is absolutely necessary. So a lot of my time is and, and energy is around people these days, our people. Um, and there is, you know, some some key client relationships that I'm, um, involved with and I, I really enjoy that. I love working with clients and, and helping them grow their businesses. You know, so um, that's, you know, those are most of the things I'm involved with. My, I have a great um, co-CEO, David Sawiri. We work together um, 
you know, for close to 17 years. We've been CEO, co-CEOs since 2010. It's a nice long run and we've had a lot of success. Um, but David um, and I sort of divide up our, our um, regions geographically. So we both are in New York and, and run the New York headquarters office, but I will also look after our EMEA operations in Europe and the Middle East. And so some of my time is spent doing that. Cool. You know, we had talked a little bit um, at the top of the show before we started recording about, um, you know, case studies and projects that you might want to talk about. And one of the ones that we uncovered, uh, this little university branding project near the Red Sea, which turned out to be, by by my opinion, maybe the most amazing case of scope creep that I've ever heard of. So tell us a little bit about where that little university project took you. That was a, that was a that's a great project. It was. Um... It was a um, a project that came to us via another Omnicom agency, Fleischman Hillard, um, who's a big uh, public relations firm. And I'm friendly with, at that time, the the, um, the woman who was head of the Washington, D.C. operation. She gave me a call. She said, you know, Howard, could you come down to Washington next week? We have um, some folks coming in from the Middle East, and they um, are involved in creating a new um, postgraduate science and technology university. And I think they need a logo. So I was like, okay, sure. I'll, you know, I'll come down. And so I did. And as we sat in the room and started talking about what they were doing, the scale, suddenly the scale of it um, became clear that, um, that this was a brand new world-class um, graduate science and technology university being built in, at, right on the Red Sea with a town around it and nothing existed there. And now mm-hmm. later I went there, it was just sand, sand and sea. <laughs> um, so um, as we were talking and they, uh, I said, I proposed to them, you know, I, I think you should think about this design project more expansively than a logo. And the mental model I would have for you is Disney World in Orlando, Florida. Mm-hmm. And if you've ever been there, you know, you start to have that experience when you're miles away from the, the, the rides. Yeah. As you drive into that, it's an enormous, um, it's really a town. And you start to see the hotels and um, the, the whole sort of uh, experience, the signage, the, the nomenclature, the names, you know, of all the places and then you get into that um, environment and you're surrounded by an experience. And I, I said, you know, I, I really think you guys should think about this in those terms. And they said, you're absolutely right. So that project, you know, took about two years and um, it went from this logo to instead um, you know, naming the university, creating an entire identity experience principles, then naming the town, and then naming every street in the town in both Arabic and English, mm. and every park, theater, place of worship, you know, golf courses, you know, just a, a whole, creating a whole experience. And, and it was exciting both for that, the scale and scope, and that it was really you know, employing design to create an incredible experience, but also because that university um, was going to attract people from all over the world. And, you know, we thought could really be a force um, for peace, to tell you the truth, you know, to educate people, to expose people to different cultures, to really celebrate intellect ideas and things like that. And, And being right at the crossroads of so much conflict in the world at the Middle East that it could be really a force for positive change, you know, which I think it is today. So that was a that was a pretty cool project. And and some massive scope creep. Yeah, right. I don't think we said what the name of it was. It's it's the King Abdullah University of Science and Technology. The acronym is KAUST. And you know, and as you were teasing me about why we worked for so many <laughs> Um, clients that are acronyms. Yeah, um, what is it? I have SAP, DXC, CVS, and HP. Um, and there's only some of them. There's, you know, there's, there's <laughs> that's a handful. Yeah. Um, you know, I've heard so many takes on this. So I, I've got 
two questions in this whole acronym joke here, but they're real questions. Um, one is I feel like so many companies, when they get to have this global presence that like the acronym naming becomes kind of the default, or maybe that's the smartest, or maybe that's the easiest. Um, how do you guys advise a firm like someone like Hewlett Packard, who's like, okay, do we go by the full name or do we take it to HP? And how, how do you kind of coach them through that branding decision? Yeah, well, it's a great question. Yeah. And as with so many things, there's not like a, everyone is sort of unique, you know. Um, sometimes, like in the case of um, SAP, those letters stand for very long German words that uh, Americans would, and the people in, in everywhere except for Germany would really struggle with. In fact, the, the longest word on, on uh, that there is, I think, is a German word, you know. You could, like, Google it, you know. But, um, <laughs> so that became something that that's, and, and they were called SAP before we ever got involved with them back mm-hmm. in 2009. Um, and so it was sort of in place, it was established, and, and there, it was a simplifier in a way. Um, in the case of, you know, CVS Health, we help them go from CVS to CVS Health. We help them with that naming and then, you know, uh, a whole new um, branding program around that. But CVS um, standed for some, just stood for something that they had expanded so far beyond. You know, they, they, they were founded, I think, in Rhode Island and that's stood for something like the, you know, convenience and value store or something. Mm. Like that. That's just not who they are. Yeah. But meanwhile, they had, you know, over 5,000 stores around the country. And so the notion of changing all that signage, that would have been, that would have cost them more than $100 million. Mm. So there was, there's a practical reality to that, you know, um, in the case of HP, so we started working with HP a long time ago when they were Hewlett Packard, but since then they split into two companies. So now one is, and so it became a trademark issue in terms of an ownership issue in terms of those two brand new mm. companies. Mm-hmm. And so as the company split, they agreed one would be HP, and it's actually HP Inc., and the other one would be Hewlett Packard Enterprise. And so there, there were sort of legal and trademark issues that drove that. In the case of DXC, you know, we helped them with that name too. We actually advised them not to go to an acronym because if you're, you're a brand new startup and you're trying to establish name rec- recognition, it costs a lot of money to make an acronym identifiable and to have it include some meaning and things like mm-hmm. that. So, but their, C- their CEO really... Love that acronym. It also stands for the Digital Transformation Corporation. And that's sort of the the um, kind of behind the scenes insider awareness. And that was, you know, the singular idea that DXC was about was about change. You know, mm-hmm. helping their clients thrive on change. So it sort of worked on that level. So I guess it's a long answer. That's that it's, you know, everyone is kind of unique. All things being equal. We, we think, you know, acronyms are not the best approach, but sometimes there's other things that determine it. Yeah. A lot of my, um, my prior work was with a firm that I had started, ran for about 16 years. And a lot of the work that we did was in professional services space. So we were branding architecture, engineering, you know, construction firms. And historically, when you bring a new partner on, you add his name to the sign and the letterhead. And yeah. so those those firms often became acronym firms as well, too. So, it's right. um, you know, I've had these conversations so many times with clients. It's, it's just interesting to hear your perspective on that. Yeah, they can get unwieldy for sure. <laughs> right. And sometimes, you know, the, it's interesting, and this is true of brands, you know, where in a way that for really established brands, the public in a way is a major stakeholder. And sometimes I think, you know, kind of a co-owner. Mm-hmm. If the public starts calling you a shortened version of your name, um, you know, that's sometimes it's good to adopt that. So, for example, one of our really great programs was for the YMCA. And the, um, the YMCA had really evolved from what it was, you know, originally founded to do into, you know, 
And people, and what people thought of it as sort of, we call it swim and gym. But really, there was so much, such a, a more vital part of the communities they were in and helping people with, with a much wider array of sort of life issues. And the, the world called them the why. So mm-hmm. we um, counseled them to just adopt the Y as your new name, your new identity. Legally, they, they could still be YMCA, but all the signage now is just the Y. So we, that was really a great program where we helped them simplify and respond to what the world was calling them anyway. And that was really powerful for them. Yeah, well, again, that I think really reinforces um, what you guys are are founded on and that that idea of simplicity. Um, and just, you know, scrolling through your portfolio and looking at the projects, it, there's a lot of, uh, you see a lot of that in your work. There's just like simple, elegant, clean design. And I, I think that, um, that visually is so nice just to see that, um, that package together. And, I, you know, again, as a branding geek, I love seeing like that you pull out, here's the colors and the fonts and the, the package and the, the images and how we treat things. And, um, just a really cool way um, for for our listeners who are thinking, how do I show my branding work? I think check out the Siegel and Gale website. It's a really good good example of how you might think about doing that. Yeah, you know the best work. I, I you know I'm a student of what Siegel and Gale has done over the fifty you know last fifty plus years, and, and you know if I were going to land on the um, you know the ten that my ten favorite projects, you know. Mm-hmm. They're all the simplicity is at the core of them, and of everyone in terms of the idea and the and the design and the, and the elements and the logo or logo type or and the fonts and just um, they're really amazing. And you know, like you know, we mentioned CVS Health. You know, just to have the heart as its symbol. You know, it doesn't mm-hmm. get any simpler than that. You know, or Hewlett Packard Enterprise, where it's you know a rectangle. Um, which you know we call it the element, and that that thing is designed. It's so simple, but it's designed to be cinematic and move and and, and allow imagery that um, represents clients to in, to interact and be at the center of the element. Um, and so it's really best seen in, in animated and, and cinematic ways. But it doesn't get simpler than that. And those are you know really powerful solutions. And, that's our best work, the work that has that level of simplicity. I mean, what what we what we've just done for Bristol Myers Square, you know, that's true for that too. It's it's so fantastic. Do you feel like the simplicity message is what um, potential clients are responding to when you're when you're pitching new work or someone's coming to you? Is that is that what they're is that what they come to you seeking? Yeah, I think often that absolutely. You know, we're known for tackling kind of complicated, messy, you know, problems where you've got a product, you know, sometimes, you know, over companies are over a 10 year period could acquire a hundred other companies. Well, no. mm. Yeah. And so they wind up with a mess of names and logos and, and, you know, brand architecture that's impenetrable, you know, and, you know, identity systems and tool sets that aren't nearly robust enough for what they need or, you know, they don't have the the guidelines and training programs to allow people to, you know, implement the brand, which is what they want to do. Um, mm-hmm. So that, that companies often come to us when they've got that kind of complexity getting in the way of, you know, really a, a clear um, approach to the market. Um, and, you know, when, you know, our competitive set, you know, there's a half a dozen companies you know, brand experience and identity companies in the world that are sort of at our scale. And, you know, the, the, the most successful ones, they have a singular brand idea. Like one of them is about brand valuation. You know, one of them is about disruption. We're about simplicity. It makes yeah. it really easy for clients to put us in a bucket and say, okay, we, we've talked to these um Great companies. This one is about this. This one's about that. These are the simplicity people. Every executive says, "Well, let's make want to talk to this and people." Right. <laughs> that was Alan Siegel's genius to land on it, and it's sort of more relevant today than it was then. Yeah, as the world gets crazier and more complex, that just has you know, so when much we more hire resonance. people. That's when we hire people. That's so critical. We we. Um, 
you can divide the world into you know the people of the world in, in a lot of different ways. You know, one of one of the ways we we divide and there's yes people and there's no people. You know, we want yes people. Those are people. There's people that uh, something lands on their desk and they immediately start thinking about why that's going to be hard to do. You know, what the challenges are. And there's other people that think about start thinking about how can I do that and how can we do that. And but another another bifurcation is simplifiers and complexifiers. And um, we, we love simplifiers. Yeah, I think there's this uh, this element of optimism and curiosity that comes with that that end of simplifying. Uh, that that I'm I'm not hearing you say those words, but that's what I'm hearing you say as you're describing oh, yeah. those people. Yeah. What do you think is one of your proudest professional moments, especially at Siegel and Gale? I, I think, you know, coming into Siegel and Gale in, in 2004, you know, just after um, a lot of turmoil in the economy, not long after 9-11 and everything that followed from that, the company was, um, you know, was hurting, really. And so, um, you know, with David Sereri and with Alan Siegel and with, with a, you know, a core group of people realizing that um, this, this company had a lot of life in it and, and, um, and it had an idea that was more relevant than ever and, and building around that. And then over the next you know, years, more than tripling the size of the company and opening offices around the world and tracking it an amazing group of, of colleagues um, and you know, doing what we did with the company is uh, probably my proudest um, you know, achievement. You know, even more than individual jobs, which was so gratifying, um, mm -hmm. is what we did with Siegel and Gale. And, you know, and David and I are, you know, to this day, really grateful to Alan for the, his tutelage and mentorship and the way that he set us up to take over. And, and our, you know, our goal is to, for Siegel and Gale to be, you know, more important than ever long after we're gone. Like, Companies like yeah. Landor are long after Walter Landor. That company is still out there, and, and Lippincott is still out there. You know, Wolf Owens. You know, Wally Owens is gone. The company is still out there, and, and there's an idea that's driving it. And so, one of the things we want to do is make sure that Seagull and Gale is one of those firms. Very cool. Well, it feels like you guys are well down that path. <laughs> so that's, that's awesome. Um, maybe in addition to Alan Siegel, um, who would you list as your design heroes? Um, well, I mean, Paul Rand is one of mine just because the, it was the combination of sort of wonderful design and originality and wit, you know, mm. and, and I, I think wit is so important to great design that there's, there's always a, another way to look at it. There's always a hidden message or something like that. So Rand had that. And one of my hype heroes is April Griman. Mm -hmm. He was a breakthrough original thinker with wit and cleverness. And, um, you know, I love the, the work she did and was part of, you know, a lot, a lot of my heroes, believe it or not, are people that I've worked with here at Siegel and Gale, some of the great creative directors here. Um, you know, Doug Sellers and Ann Swan and Young Kim, um, Matthias Menke, Sophie Lutman. Um, you know, there's some Raphael Medina, you know, just really terrific people that they just blow me away. You know, I love being with them. I, you know, some of them are gone, but the work that they did is some of our best work. And it was, it was, um, it was great to be around them. So, um, and then, you know, um, I get inspired a lot by, you know, reading and, and reading about people that aren't in the design world. I just finished a biography of Muhammad Ali, you know, that um, really sort of chronicled him as he emerged on the stage in the 60s and became an anti-war protester and um, sort of did it his own way. And so I, that was really interesting. Steve Jobs. You know, I read the Jobs biography, and of course, he was a complicated person, but he, for a designer, mm -hmm. um, he was a perfectionist, and he, and he really understood things and believed in it and was um, sort of uncompromising. I think that was amazing. Um, 
So it's, it's some, uh, you know, I, I recently read a book by um, one of the founders of Pixar, uh, which was another breakthrough company. This is a book by um, Ed Catmull. And I was really inspired by how he built a creative culture um, that did amazing things. And so that was you know, really, those are some of the things that, I, that, that keep me going that I try to say, all right, look, that's a different kind of world, but there's things we can apply even to how we operate. Nice. Well, we'll listeners, we'll definitely link to all of those uh, amazing designers and thinkers and uh, books in the show notes. If you head over to obsessedshow.com and check out the episode page, you will find all the show notes there. Um, we've got to ask you this question because we ask everybody and your answer can be anything, can be life, can be design, can be business. Um, but I'm curious what it is that you find that you are most obsessed with right now. Um, it, 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 you know, in design, I'm kind of obsessed with um, cinema in a way, you know, cinematic moments and storytelling. And um, so I, I think for us and the work that we do and what we're helping our clients do with their brands, with the way they engage the world and with the way their brands happen is our, our mental model should be movies. How mm. can we tell stories in really immersive ways that are really creative um, that will come to life on the devices and in the places people are. So that's one of the things I'm obsessed with right now is um, thinking about brand and identity and design as storytelling. Mm, yeah, I love that. That's a great idea. Um, I uh, was just telling my last interview that I've, recently been really digging into photography and video and film and thinking about the, all the storytelling pieces that come into film, because it's, it's not just the script and the tone and the message, but then it's also how you choose to frame that and how you choose to kind of show every literal point of view and help the kind of guide the viewer through exactly what you want them to see and how you want them to see things. So, um, yeah, and so it's it's the stories you tell and it's how you tell them and where they are. I think you're exactly right. And so for us, you know, it's not just, okay, how do we, how, it's not just saying, okay, here's how you're going to tell stories about what you've done for the world or how you're doing it, but here's how you're going to tell it in a way that's uniquely you, you know, that's so it's brand voice again, right? Mm. And um, that's uh, something that's really exciting to me. I love it too, because it involves multiple practices at our firm, right? So it's the design team, it's the experience and digital team, it's our content team, our, our writers, um, and it's our strategists, because those stories, there needs to be a red thread, you know, across those stories so that they all become proof points for the brand promise, right? Mm -hmm. So that's what I like about it too, is it, to do it, you pull together all these different practice areas and so that you get some really rich collaboration and bright fireworks. Yeah. hundred um, percent. You know, I was thinking about, I've had this dream of designing or rebranding an airline because I think that'd be amazing to see your work fly over your head. <laughs> there's, there's not really a whole lot of other examples where you can see your work in flight. Um, do you have any dream projects or dream clients or anything you're, you're really interested in, in tackling in the future? Uh, well, that would, that would be a great one, you know, because I'm like you, you know, one of the things I love about this business is, um, you know, tens of millions of people see what we do, you know, mm -hmm. before, you know, in, in the case of CVS Health, 5 million people every single day are walking into CVS Health schools, you know, so I love doing things that, um, you know, affect the course of companies and people and lives and businesses and that the, the whole world gets to see. Um, you know, at C Siegel and Gale, we've done so. you know, we're really lucky that just the range of companies that come in to, to talk to us. So um, there's not like one I want to do that we haven't done. Um, I just, I like them all. I'm excited about them. You know? and, and, but, but we do get, you know, new ones. Like we had um, this past year, Jeffrey Katzenberg, you know, one of the um, 
you know, giants out in Hollywood and, and Meg Whitman, the former CEO of Hewlett Packard, did a startup called Quibi, which is about new content, sort of a competitor to Netflix. It's short form, mm-hmm. delivered on mobile devices. And we did all the branding for that. And that was really cool. It was a breakthrough startup company, but at scale. Um, so that they, they come in all the time. I mean, I, I, but I get excited about them all. You know, we, we recently um, rebranded Bristol Myers Squibb. You know, they had, a, they had an identity that was over 30 years old. They had just made the largest acquisition in pharmaceutical company history and, and really were changing their company and wanted a, a story that represents who they are and are going to be. And that was terribly exciting because of just the scale and, and profile of that company, but they're right in the heart of major healthcare issues and it was sort of a change moment. And one of the things too that I love is we work with CEOs and, and really senior people. And when you come across um, really creative and, and um, thoughtful and brave CEOs, that is a lot of fun. Do you feel like there's anything in particular that um, that CEOs have to do or that any qualities that makes someone a really great CEO? Like, is there any commonality that you've seen in those clients? Well, you know, they have a, you know, they're very strategic and have an expansive view of the world and where they fit into it. Um, they're very good at, about of, at thinking ahead and seeing around corners. So not only what's happening now, but if different courses are chosen, what's likely to happen going forward. They're very, very good with people at, at, at recognizing talent, real talent, real ability, and cultivating it and, and building teams. Um, you know, the ones that are, you know, really admirable are ones that have a strong sense of um, their role in society. Um, so, one, you know, one of my friends and colleagues is Bruce Broussard at Humana, one of the smartest guys I know. And, he, and he, they, they play a role in people's health and well-being, mental health as well as physical health. And that's on his mind all the time. You know, people like that just blow me away. But um, And they're brave. They're brave and they want new ideas. So, hey, before we let you go, I'm curious if you have maybe a favorite piece of advice that you've received in your career or maybe a piece of advice that you like to pass along to your team. Um, you know, I, I, there's like gosh, lots of them, you know, I mean, they come from different places. You know, one that I, I remember reading a long time ago, but it stayed with me is don't expect what you don't inspect. And it's... Um, it's sort of it's it's not about micromanaging it, but it is about taking a look at things. Mm-hmm. So, you know, if you, if you have if I if I have an expectation or a, a hope that something is going to go a certain way or we're going to explore a certain thing, just take a look at it. You know, don't don't just think it's going to happen. So and help people do it, right? And so that's one. Uh, I, I, another another mentor, you know, said to me, "Listen, it's always really important to distinguish between fact and opinion, and, and, and particularly as you're dealing with people and, and helping people resolve conflicts or challenges. Is, is help them distinguish. This is my opinion of what happened, um, and this is these are the facts of what happened. And then mm-hmm. figure out a course of action with clarity around those things. I think that's really important. I think it's important to." Um, you know, to believe in yourself and, and trust yourself. You know, I love the work, uh, the, the book Blink by Malcolm Gladwell, mm-hmm. or Paul, sort of those kinds of things. Um, and, um, and, and I think being open to new ideas, you know, if, if I, if, if that, that's one thing, you know, guard against not invented here. The best idea wins, and um, they can come from anywhere. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Is there anything else you'd like to encourage our listeners or, you know, anything that you want to want to challenge them to do? You know, just, you know, I I think, you know, it's never been a better time to be a designer. Personally, I I think the state Mm -hmm. of design is healthy, is vibrant. You know, there's so many different things that are 
being folded into the design world and, and being put on the desks of designers and saying, listen, you have permission to address this too. So I think it's um, to lean into all of that, that it's a great time to be involved in design. There's more value placed on it than ever before. There's more people doing it than ever before. There's better tools. Um, you can touch more people. The world is so connected. So, um, you know, it's, it's a great time to be a designer. Awesome. Well, um, before we say goodbye, let our uh, listeners know where we can track you down online and learn more about Siegel and Gale. Well, SiegelGale.com. SiegelGale.com is, um, you know, that's my principal platform. Um, I'm on uh, Instagram, Simple with Smart, my handle. Um, nice. <laughs> of course, I'm on LinkedIn and, um, and those kind of places. Awesome. Well, Howard, it was a pleasure getting to chat with you today. Thanks for reaching out. Thanks for including me. You know, what you're doing is really important too. I think, you know, you're helping designers stay connected. Um, and that's really important to them. Well, that's awesome. Man. Thanks for being a part of it. And thank you for being obsessed with design. Okay, kids, that's episode number 151 in the books. For all of today's show notes, head over to obsessedshow.com. And if you haven't already while you're there, add your email address to our newsletter. I'll update you on some of my favorite new episodes and some cool things I find in my daily obsessions. Of course, all the links are over at obsessedshow.com to all the places you can find this show, iTunes, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, SoundCloud, Google Play, and Spotify. So no matter where you find your podcasts, chances are you can listen to Obsessed Show from there. Just head over to obsessedshow.com. The Obsessed Show is produced by yours truly, Josh Miles. To have me speak or MC at your next event, head over to joshmiles.com to learn more. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.